a container is just a software program that's running and running from these images and the images are running on top of what's called a container runtime a piece of software that starts up the container image as a running process and sets up all the restrictions on that process and also if necessary creates the user for the process to run under any kind of networking that the container needs to interact with the outside world and so forth. So these container runtimes are typically they're going to be Docker or Container D and even Docker itself is using something like Container D under the hood. These container processes are just software programs. One of the big differences is that rather than running as whoever started the program up, they run as the user they're configured to run as. Plus there's all those restrictions and another big difference is, is that these processes are not really aware of the underlying operating system because they have all the files they need in the image itself and they don't have to interact with the operating system because they're just talking to that container runtime. And so what makes containers so portable is that they're not tightly coupled with the underlying virtual machine. And so containers are going to offer a consistent experience to developers and users and it's one of the reasons that developers like them so much. We can take a look at starting up some containers with Docker. So if we want to start up a database server for example we can use docker run and then we have to give the name of the image that contains the database. In our case it's this one here. If we want the database to be accessible to us we're going to have to map the ports. The container itself is listening on port 3306, but this is not accessible to us outside the container environment in the virtual machine. That would be only be accessible to other containers that are running in that same container environment on the same virtual network. We can fix that though by passing in an option that causes the container's private port 3306 to be exposed to the virtual machine on the virtual machine port 3306. That will give us access to interact with this running container. So we'll go ahead and start it. And it can take a minute for the service to get set up and initialized. Let's go over to another screen and then we'll take a look at the network connections. So if we do a netstat ano and we look for listening ports, then we can look through these and look for anything with 3306. If you get a lot of the stream, that's just the Unix sockets, so you can filter those out with ANOT for TCP and that'll lessen the number. Here we see the 3306 listening on the IPv6, and then if we scroll up a little bit, we'll find the same listening over there on IPv4. Stop the container. We need to know its name or its ID. If we do a Docker PS, we'll see all the containers that are running and we'll see their real name, which is their container ID, and then we'll also see the name that was given to them. We could have given our container a name as well when we started it with the dash dash name flag. But knowing either the ID or the name, we'll be able to interact with the container, including the ability to stop the container. So back in our original window, what we'll notice is, is that uh, Docker runtime took care of shutting down the MySQL service gracefully and then stopping the container. Of course, starting and stopping these containers manually would be impractical for someone to keep up with for a large set of containers. And that's where container orchestration comes into play. We can write a set of commands or code, if you will, to give instructions to an orchestrator to start and stop the containers on our behalf and coordinate all their activities like wiring up all the different network ports and so forth. So in the next video, we'll jump more into the orchestration, taking a look at Docker Compose.